Next, we're going to hear from Stephen Friend. Stephen is president of Sage Bionetworks. Um, before leading Sage Bionetworks, he has had led a storied career. He led cancer research at Merck. He's been involved with multiple startups, including co-founding Rosetta Informatics. Um, he's served on multiple medical school faculties. Um, Stephen has great expertise in most of his career in cancer and in drug discovery. But today, Stephen is on a mission to make large-scale, data-intensive biology broadly accessible to the entire research community. And he has uncovered some new ways of affecting that change. Please welcome to the stage a friend of our ecosystem, Stephen Friend. Nice to get the intro from you, uh, Greg. Nice that we were together in San Francisco. I like coming here as a participant, um, as uh, someone who's part of a study. Um, I want to begin with what gives me envy, uh, and it's the following. When you, um, you, I don't know if you know uh, Luis Van On, he was at uh, Carnegie Mellon, but he's the person who uh, figured out this structure called CAPTA, and that stands for Completely Automated Public Turing Test to Tell Computers and Humans Apart. And the, and the part that I like is that actually, after he thought this up, he realized that there were millions of individuals who were going on to get on, you know, go, go in flight and other things to get security uh, passwords, and they were totally wasting their time. And you may know this story. He said, let's capture that. Let's capture that time, and let's put it to something that machines can't do. Can we have all those people for five, 10 seconds actually start translating words in all the digital books, or books that need to be digitized? And uh, to that extent, um, he began enrolling the world to solve his task. And now, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of books get um, basically digitized by all of us doing simple tasks. The second is an uh, individual, Patrick uh, Meyer, who was one of the co-founders of Yu Shahidi, who again looked out and he said, we've got a big project. Um, and if we could engage people, whether it was in elections in Kenya, whether it was in Haiti, whether it was in Japan, you probably know that what he figured out how to do was to effectively engage everyone. Now, the reason I say I'm jealous or I have envy is that's not happening in medicine. Okay. It's not happening at that scale and scope. And so I think we have to look at how that works. And the person who I think has thought well about this, you may also know, is uh, Clay Shirky. And he has this concept of cognitive surplus that you should look up. And so it's a really simple concept. The idea is that in the world, um, he adds up that there are like a trillion hours per year of participatory value. You could, you know, I'll go uh, birding, you can golf, you can uh, look at the television. But what happened in the 1990s was that actually that got fused with the digital media internet and it helped people consume. It didn't do much good, but it helped people consume. And so what he uh, recognized was actually in this century, um, what is beginning to happen is people are beginning to recognize that you're going to sort of put those two together, participatory um, opportunities, with that, all that free time. And that's what he calls cognitive surplus. So ancient generosity with modern digital tools, cognitive surplus. And so what we need to figure out in order to make sense of ourselves in a health standpoint is how do we use that cognitive surplus? And that's something that we've been thinking about. So why can't we use that for health and disease? Well, the first could be that actually those really smart uh, physicians, researchers, actually have already got it all plugged in. And all we need is to get data. Right? We just get the data to them. The, we're in, in, in good shape. Um, and in fact, if you, there, in the last couple of years, there's been this really, uh, I think, awkward uh, description of sort of like being in the end game, that you know, now genomes are really cheap. We've got all this data. Advertisers are using it. Um, it's sort of like, you know, thank God we have it solved. Here's the problem. Every single protein in any part of any cell, when you modify it by whether it's a heterozygous or a homozygous change going on, 
it actually, like a tumbler along a massive uh, string, actually affects every single other protein there. So you cannot go and read out from any um, list, I have this, I have that, I have APOE4, et cetera, and actually get to an answer. And it's not about the certainty into the individual. Altered component lists are, in some ways, a mirage to what we really need to get to, which is actually making sense of that function. And the reason we can't do that is that unlike the chemists and unlike the physicists, we don't know the rules. So this is an example of 1700s alchemists, which is exactly what we are today. We get all excited because we have all this data and we put it into packages. We have no idea how the system works. We don't know the rules. And why we need each of us engaged, why we need a million eyeballs on it, is that we've got to figure out what's going on. We have to understand the rules. So the next thing is that's true, but maybe the system knows this. It's all set up. We can just assume that we're ready to roll into this. And here, there's a very important problem. Our scientific systems, whether it's in academic or industrial research, were built for biomedicine to be hypothesis-driven data analysis, where the people who generate the data, whether it's in humans or in model systems, got the data, did the analysis, and it came back. And there's this loop that, that zooms around where the same people who did the study, look at the data, come up with the insights, go around and around like this. Again, in physics, in meteorology, in other areas where big data has been used, what they know is there's a very big problem. You get so much data out there that you actually need a lot of people doing the loop up there on the analysis and coming through. So we must crack this loop. We've got to figure out a way of uncoupling that automatic uh, linkage. Which takes me to a companion to what George showed this morning. He showed Moore's Law, and I think most people understand that. Um, I'm really uh, concerned about Metcalfe's Law. Metcalfe's Law is the relationship that shows that compatibly communicating devices actually the power of that grows with the square of, the, of their number. Now, that works really well for fax machines. It works beautifully for the internet. It does not work for biomedical research. And the reason is that we are completely stalled out by the fact that our currency, our gold coins, are articles. And our scientists, good meaning as they are, in any foundation, any academic setting, have this sense that they don't get any credit and they can't communicate what they know until they get that credit, and that's crushing us. So there's an article that came out this week in Nature Biotechnology on this law, on the problem with this, and why we need to be able to speed this up. And at a fundamental level, the real problem is that we have gotten ahead of ourselves. The state of our technology is now spewing out this spectacular data. People are wearing, willing to wear any device and give that data. There are ways to, to pull these up into network models and to run competitions and challenges that let anyone from students up work on it. And what do we have? Where's the major part where the, quote, experts are? The guilds are sitting in feudal institutions. There's a discontinuity between the state of the institution and the state of the technology. We cannot live like this, where as if we're in Warhammer, people are going to some labs versus others. They think they can't get engaged because experts are, do, are doing this or that. So four years ago, as Greg said, started a think tank uh, nonprofit foundation called Sage Bionetworks in Seattle. And what we think about is we're going, what's this going to look like soon? And what can we do to make it so that there are open collaborative ways where citizens and researchers are working together, not just the existing guilds of experts? So you can go on our website, you can look at our philosophy, you can look at some of the projects that we do. I just want to talk about a couple. The first is we had to solve for the puzzle that most people don't get credit for what they're doing unless they're the first or last author on a one-name journal. Okay? This is hundreds of years old. Okay? It sort of worked for a while. But in reality, other uh, worlds have figured out how to do this. So over here is a site you can look up called GitHub. G-I-T-H-U-B. And GitHub is a place where software engineers learned how to form teams, how to get credit, how to build things. 
Most importantly, they learned how to make sure someone who had a good idea or used someone else's had the credit. So on GitHub, you go on there, when you apply for a job, is what I should say, and you go in for that job interview, someone doesn't look at a CV. They don't care what your papers are on software. What they want to know is what did you actually uh, pull off? So we've been building a GitHub equivalent for sharing ideas and data so that you could actually have that uh, willingness to work together. So Synapse, one of the tools that we've built, is called a GitHub for biomedical uh, research. And it allows the data and the versions to be, uh, sorry, the data to be versioned. And more importantly, and this is at the heart of it, it has provenance. So it can go on and it says, this group at UCSF was doing this with at Memorial Sloan Kettering, or this group at UBC was doing with that. And um, th that has made it such that, for example, the TCGA project has 60 groups who are all putting their work together. And now we've been working with nature, with PLOS, with science, with the publishers to figure out how can we actually have that credit? How can we actually uh, work with that? The second of the three tools or experiments that we've been working on has been how do you get the crowd engaged in working on your problems? And for this, I think most people know of the XPRIZE, the incentive, the Kaggle type uh, challenges. We've been interested in using challenges as a way to grow communities of individuals who want to work together. So I'm going to give you an example of one that just came out in a couple that we're doing. So the first one um, that we did together with IBM was that we took 2,200 women's uh, records who were in Canada and in the UK and hosted their clinical and genomic data up in the cloud. And Google gave us 1,000 core of free compute space for anyone who wanted to work on that. We then took that information and um, hosted it up there with the prize being getting an article without basically um, bypassing peer review, saying the winner has beat everyone else. What is peer review? Okay? And making it a direct process where winner gets paper, needs to have advisors working with them. And science was kind enough to do that. The IBM team was key. We started it in the uh, early uh, in, uh, fall, and in six and a half weeks, the teams working around the world beat the groups at Stanford, beat the groups at Columbia, beat the group at Harvard, beat the group various places, because they were working together. Um, the, um, in the end, this came out this past week, a couple of days ago. It's the cover of Science Translational Medicine. The point that was, was captured, which is the most important, was it wasn't actually what was found, it was how it was found, okay? This is a way very efficiently to get a, lot, a million eyeballs on the project and to actually have sense out of it, to have credit out of it. And the fun thing is by the time it was published in Synapse, groups had actually already moved it further than the paper. So by the time the paper got published, you could go in, you could look and see where it had gone since then. So the IBM Dream Team fused with us. Gustavo likes to say we got married. And now the dream change, uh, uh, challenges are done by SAGE. This next year, we just launched four challenges. I want to point out one because I think as a participant in PGP, this is sort of an interesting one. This was done with NIEHS, uh, NCATS, and UNC on toxicogenomics, on what happens in the environment and genes and the interactions that go on there. So this is 1,000 individuals where everyone had whole genome sequencing. And they've gone in and used all these compounds and looked at what happened to those individuals when they had this compound, this compound, this compound. And we're going to host a challenge to see who can predict what individuals are more sensitive to what compounds, how does the environment interact with individuals. But they didn't do it with the PGP group. They did it with another group. We're also working with the Rheumatoid Arthritis uh, Foundation. Um, Robert Plenge on something that's going to be announced soon, where patients who take drugs, half are, half are not responding, are actually giving, I responded, I didn't. We take their genetic data, we post it up in the cloud, and we're going to run a challenge and see if we can get anyone in the world to solve why are some people getting a response, why are some people not getting a response. We're working on breast cancer. This is made possible in part by giving consent control back to patients. So just like Sharon talked about for the project uh, of being able to pull in data, 
The Consent to Research Project, its, its sister project done by John Wilbanks, which is uh, called WeConsent.us, is a project, portable legal consent, that again allows individuals to share work their, uh, with their data. I think we need to have the PGP consents, which are the Zen masters of these consents, the work that we're doing, the work that Sharon is doing, and others all over the world start having interoperability for those consents so we can move that data around. And it leads me to the last project, which is we have to democratize biomedical research and make it so that the guilds of experts aren't driving it. In our mind, that takes actually how do you make co-partners. There's a massive asymmetry between the rich genotypic data and we just don't have enough phenotypic data. I'm not going to go through this. It's going to be online. You can look at it later. But this is basically a mechanism that allows you to collect trait information, community engagement, and get patient research databases that then would allow you to go on to Synapse. So Synapse is sort of like a geek sandbox, but it's got to be tied in and made useful. And so Bridge, a project we're doing with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, is now working with a number of individual uh, disease communities. Why can't we work with PGP? And look at how could those individuals do something. So I want to give one example. Uh, actually, I'd love to give two, but I think for time I'll give one. Your smartphone or Android has such a good microphone on it that Max Little, working over here at the MIT Media Lab, showed that he could get enough pattern recognition off that microphone that in one minute of listening to your voice, he could give as accurate a recording of how your Parkinson's was. That would apply to other types of neurodegeneration. And so he, using this Parkinson voice uh, initiative, has gotten to the point now where we're going to work with him patients like me, Parkinson's UK, groups in Europe, and actually start rolling this out across entire countries where everyone in the country will be able to pull that data. We're going to take that data, put it up in the cloud, and then host it. Who can build the best classifier? So we'll then come back to the patients uh, using Bridge to get to Synapse, to get to the challenges, and come back. So this is the summary. The idea is we need two massive gears that aren't meshing. On the research side, we need to enable teams of teams to evolve their ideas and how they work together. We need the passion, the energy, the insights, the data from patients, um, nudging them, pushing them, correcting them, and empowering that public to nurture as full partners if we're going to have that next generation of biomedical research. And so I want to end with the following thoughts. Think of how we need to have our eyes wide open regarding complexity and implications. We kid ourselves at how much we've solved. Secondly, researchers can't live as hermits. Thirdly, the public should not be a voyeur. And lastly, the energy towards enabling others is what I think is where the heart of this is. And what I mean by that is until we get to a non-rivalrous world where what each of us is doing is trying to make sure that the Huntington's buzz is working well, other, when we start nurturing each other's efforts and not going solely on our own, then we're going to get somewhere. So I think it's very important, similar to what Sharon said about the we, that we've got to figure out how these very tender seedlings will actually be helped by each other instead of going, my sprout's a little larger than, than yours. So with that, I think I can take a question or two things. You're good? Greg, you're here? Okay. Jason? Go ahead. Hey, uh, I have a question actually. So, the, um, Currently, I think the biggest impediment is at the WE level. I was a grad student. I you know, work with many other labs in various projects. And I also now run a genomics company. And the biggest request we get is adding more privacy controls mm -hmm. because grad students are worried that their lab mates are going to use their data. Yeah. The biggest request we got was for PIs to have more privacy because they're worried about getting scooped. I think industry and uh, 
nonprofits have more collaboration than academia currently. And um, I think the biggest impediment to uh, the collaborative model is actually the, the, which, the business model of academia where credit is apportioned by papers and papers can only have first authors and senior authors. And I'm skeptical that um, without solving this problem, yeah. there will be greater collaboration between yeah. academic centers. Yeah. Um, I think actually you've said it extremely well, so I'm not going to repeat that. I'm going to uh, say that what I found is under 35. So the individuals who are willing to take the risks, who are going to go, you know, I really should be doing it for the patients, are in a group that are under 35. It's the associate professors that sort of are still part of Rome that are having the hardest time. And I think, it, I challenge the young investigators and, uh, and, but you can't do that without offering them something like Synapse that allow, or it can be any version of it, but you have to have provenance, you have to get uh, credit. And I think we have to remember, nine, I think the number is 95% of tech transfer offices can't pay for their own office in institutions, okay? And they're not, they're not helping innovation. And so I think there's pressure on institutions to where can you get, uh, how can I put a specific deal with a company and how can I make that uh, you know, grow into something and, and that means sequestering, right? If you're gonna pay for something, why would you pay for it if anyone had access to it? And so I think um, we have to build a system where um, we free up that generosity that's sitting there and that will happen, I think, when people can get uh, more direct credit. Thank you, Stephen. 